Okay. Well, I hope everybody enjoyed their coffee and bagel. Um, I know I did. I got to speak with a few of you. So thank you for joining. Um, the session that you've joined now is our ProLink HFA data views and reporting session, which will be presented by Ben Rolader, who is our business analyst to at ProLink Solutions. As a business analyst to at ProLink, Ben serves as a data maker migration lead um, in executing data migrations to bring on new HFA clients. Ben also leads discovery sessions with ProLink's new agencies on their current data structure and analyzes client data sources to define the business rules to be able to import their source data into ProLink HFA. So he's really kind of in the weeds of our implementations. Um, some of you may be working with Ben right now if you're going through implementation or you will you will soon know his name um, if you're going to be starting one soon. All right. And Ben, I think with that, I'm going to hand things off to you to begin your presentation. So you can um, go ahead and grab the screen share. Okay. Welcome everybody. Um, can you see my screen okay? Yeah, I see the, the first slide. Okay, perfect. Um, yeah, my name is Ben Rolliter. As Bree mentioned, I am a business analyst to your ProLink Solutions. Um, yeah, performing data migration activities for our new clients. So it's my job to analyze the uh, source data that our clients have in their older systems that are being migrated to ProLink and then define the logic for moving those things over. Um, so an important part of the migrate of data migration is the fidelity of the data going in. Um, as Bree and Jim mentioned, in the importance of adoption, the, the your data in ProLink HFA is very powerful. Um, if leveraged correctly, you can draw some really valuable insights in um, how your agency is performing, as well as uh, some of the other metrics that you might be looking at from a reporting standpoint. So the best tool to be able to do that is using data views, as Jim has kind of given you a demo on, um, on, on some important use cases there. So thank you for that, Jim. Um, I'll be getting more into the nuts and bolts as far as how data views work. And starting at the very beginning from the user interface kind of defined data views. Um, so just visualizing the data that currently exists um, by a subject area. And then I'll uh, move through some of the navigation in data views and then get into uh, custom data views at the end. So uh, I got a lot of slides to get through. Let's go ahead and jump in. Okay, so yeah, gone through my agenda. Uh, I guess we got our first poll question to start things off. So how have you used ProLink's data view functionality to assist in day-to-day -day operations at your agency? A, yes, B, no. Um, C, what's a data view? D, I'm just here for the coffee and bagels. Give you guys about 30 seconds and then we'll uh, view the results here. Hey, Ben, there may be a delay, so I'll just read off the results. We have uh, 40 said yes, uh, 11 responses for no, six responses for what's a data view, and then two responses that are just here for coffee and bagels. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so it sounds like we've got a pretty wide audience here. For those of you that haven't used data views in your agency's day-to-day -day operations, the first part of this presentation will be more relevant to you. For those of you that do use them on a day-to-day -day basis, the latter uh, 20 slides at the end of my presentation will probably be more relevant to you on the more technical aspects around custom data views. So um, let's keep moving. So for those of you that answered, what is a data view? A data view is um, a visualization tool that provides the ability to view your data in ProLink HFA in a row-based tabular format. Um, even just having 
a visualization into the data stored on one of your objects here listed on the uh, left-hand navigation screen. You can draw some pretty valuable insights without having to do any custom work using um, filtering, grouping, quick search. Um, there are a lot of tools here to slice and dice your data to be able to make it valuable to you. Um, so this is, yep, as Jim was showing what a data view looks like. Why should you use a data view? Um, so for those of you that are newer clients that maybe haven't had the option to use this functionality, you might be doing your reporting on a uh, Excel spreadsheet currently across multiple sheets that you're populating manually. Um, organizing all of those, getting your uh, filters right, having the ability to have users collaborate on the visualization are advantages gained in using ProLinks data views. So um, as this slide talks about, the, the data views will replace your kind of Excel-based reporting where you are trying to get a feel for how your properties are performing or how the loans that you are um, issuing as an agency are, are, are performing as well. So So, yep, a few different use cases here, as Jim mentioned in detail, but the uh, you can use uh, simple reports that might be a, a kind of a more managerial focused data view like Jim was showing. Um, you can save custom reports for later, we'll get into that, uh, or custom views rather, ad hoc queries. Um, just a quick at a glance, list of properties filtered by some criteria you can use data views for that and then um navigation as well so we'll we'll touch on that in a later on but uh through a data view you can actually navigate through the system into the source records to be able to get uh, more information about the data that you're displaying in your data view so that's the link to the detailed information. Um, in terms of data view organization, data views are um, organized, as I was mentioning before, on the left-hand navigation under the data views tab, and then they're broken down by functional area. So depending on each subject area of asset management, uh, dev for your dev deals, entities, finance, et cetera. You've got options underneath those with standard um, data views to be able to click into the child objects that live underneath these parent objects. So an example of those would be your compliance reviews under the subject area of portfolio property. I like to, just from an organization standpoint, I like to keep a lot of these closed, these folders collapsed while I'm... Um, and this is just a personal preference thing, but it reduces the list. So when you have an idea of which subject area you, you want to create a visualization in, you'll have um, a collapsed view to be able to quickly navigate between the uh, parent objects listed on this uh, navigation screen. Oh, one thing I forgot to mention there, the favorites bar. Uh, favorites is at the top. I'll show you how to set those, but that's a great tool to be able to navigate to the data views that you use most frequently. Um, in, in terms of data view organization, as I mentioned, under a functional area such as uh, dev deal, portfolio property loan, TCA deal, you'll have information about the objects that that live underneath of those parent objects. Uh, let's see, screen layout. So from the left-hand navigation, once you click into a data view name, you'll be brought to the data view screen 
where you'll have um, you'll generate the visualization. You also have this toolbar that will pop up up above the um, header for the object that you're looking at. And there are a few things that you can do here, such as uh, create a new visualization, a new view, um, by clicking the page button on the far left end of the uh, toolbar up above. The view manager, which allows you to custom tailor to the, the, v, the data view to the needs that you have, um, whether you're doing an ad hoc report, trying to get um, gain insights or create some sort of actual um, view to be shared by your agency. You can, you can customize the columns utilized here as well as create advanced filters. Uh, the cancel button is the abort mission button. So uh, that's undo if you need to cancel out of the object that you're in. Export exports the screen that you're seeing with all of the um, filters that are um, creating the data view and limiting the data that you're seeing on screen, uh, the export button will export the data in that format. So if you have filters applied and you only want, you don't want to look at the full list of raw data in the data view, you can use that button. Otherwise, the unformatted, the unformatted export just uh, exports the totality of the data presented in the data view. So that'll give you a list of every single record generated in the data view. Then you've got, um, turn filter grid on or off. Initially, it starts as on. Um, so you can use this to be able to uh, enable filtering within your data view. I'll show that. I'll get into the UI here in just a second and show you a few of these things. And then restore default filters reverts the filters in the data view to whatever they were saved as when the data view is created for a standard uh, default data views that are just net through the navigation on um, screen without creating a view and saving it. Those will there will be no filters applied when you restore the default filters. If you do have a, a view created with filters and that is saved, then the filters will return to that state with the, with that button. And then finally, set as favorite allows for this data view in Histor the the view is called historical properties. It's in it's in the portfolio properties object. If you save this as a favorite when you're in the left hand navigation um, within data views, that favorites button with the yellow star, this uh, this view will be will be populated on that list. So you don't have to search through portfolio properties and then generate the view. Um, so kind of a ease of use. Um, advantage there. Okay, paging. So down at the bottom um, corner of your screen, data where you have more records that can fit on a page are broken down into pages. So you can use this arrow, the line, the bottom, if you can see the bottom left hand corner here, the first button is will bring you back to the first page in your results. The um, far right button over here will bring you to the very last page of your results. And then the two middle arrows will just page over one. You can also use the search um, button here to be able to go to a specific page in your records. The rows per page, uh, number of rows displayed per page just defines the um, number of records or rows on screen while you're looking at a data view. So the max is 500. That will make it so that you have to do a lot more scrolling through your data, but then it all, it's all present in one screen. So 
just comes down to user preference, whether or not you want to be looking at a larger list of results or not. And there are different use cases on why you might do that, um, such as if you're looking at um, doing some a review of compliance reports at risk, hopefully you don't expect to have more than um, 20 um, reviews that haven't been received on time. For example, you might limit the number of search results to 20 to just be um, to reduce the size and focus your view onto the key at risk um, properties that would be defined on that data view. Otherwise, if you're looking at a general list of your properties by county, you might look at 500 and um, group by county, and then you'll be able to scroll through more of your portfolio that way. Um, Oh, that slide should be taken out. That was actually written. So I'll keep this up. This this functionality has actually been for those of you familiar with um, data views that haven't read the release notes for Q3. This functionality was actually retired this year. So there's no longer an alpha um, filter here. Quick search on the upper right hand. Uh, upper right corner of the uh, data view underneath your toolbar allows you to uh, qu quick search a record by highlighting over the um, quick search label. You're able to see the types of columns that you can search by within that view. And so deal number, receipt of, receipt of attorney's opinion, due date, RFO date, deal property name and deal name are the columns that you can quick reference by looking here. So yeah, if you're more comfortable with your TCA deal numbers, you can use those. You can search by the uh, deal name as well, as well as if you're looking for a specific key date here. Uh, when you're searching by dates, it's important to use the format of two-digit day, two-digit month, and four-digit year. So this is what this is, screen navigation. So coming back to um, some of the value of Data views, clicking into a record or a row in a data view will bring you to its the actual record in the system outside of the data view. So since we're looking at a TCA deals data view and where the view is all active 8609s issued, selecting this first row of Garden Court Apartments in uh, HFA 5617 will bring you to that TCA deal where then you can go and um, click into the 8609s that were issued to be able to um, see if you were looking, if, if this was submitted as being a multi-building project or not, for example, within the 8609. Uh, you could also potentially just bring that column into this data view without having to click into the record, but you get additional property information, business unit information, which isn't populated on this data view, um, et cetera. So just the entirety of the TCA deal, if you need to review that. As I mentioned before, the Excel export button will export the data that's in your data view with the filters applied. So you can see we have property name sorted ascending. Uh, you can tell by A that it's uh, highlighted yellow and then B that there is a small upwards facing arrow on screen. Uh, property name starting at 100 South Palm Avenue here when you export the data view that is that filter is reflected without um, a filter applied on to the Excel spreadsheet. So 
you're starting with the data in the shape that you created it inside of the data view here. Working with your data. Um, so this goes back to what I was saying on my last slide with sorting by a selected column um, by clicking on the name of the column. That's an important little detail for to, to those of you who aren't as familiar with using data views in Perlink HFA to be able to apply the ascending or descending um, sorts onto a column. You need to make sure to click on the left hand side of the um, of the column header over by the name. So if you click on the right side on the blank part of the screen, that may not re recognize the filter. So make sure you click on the left side. The, the um, default state is just unsorted on a column. And if you click on loan number once, it'll, it'll sort ascending. So smallest to largest loan numbers. If you click on the same spot again on loan number, you'll have a descending sort applied on that column. So uh, now we're starting at ZU 119. And then to unsort the column, you click on it a third time. So, yeah, pretty self explanatory there. Working with your data using multiple sorts at the same time. This is a cool way to be able to reshape your data view to make um, to kind of make a more granular view at what you at the data that you want to see. So you can add multiple sorts at the same time to really narrow down on a set of conditions that you would um, that you're looking for by accessing this data view. So if we've got a sorts applied across multiple columns, you can just hover over one of the columns, doesn't matter which one that has a sort applied, and then it will tell you all of the um, sorts that have been applied to that data view. So by hovering over servicer, which is a descending sort right now, you can see that servicer loan number is also showing as ascending. So if you've got um, 30 or 40 columns present in a data view, that can be a useful way so that you to keep track of the sorts you're, you've applied so that you don't um, get lost in the columns. So grouping, grouping is another way to be able to reorganize your data view to cater to your um, reporting needs. So by just dragging a column header into the light blue box above the data view column header row, you'll be grouping by that column so by dragging servicer up to the into the group window you'll now have a list of all of your loans by servicer so let's take a look at that in the user interface here may need to refresh i may have been logged out since i started this presentation okay so i'm here now in Perl and hfa looking at the loans um, functional area. And then I'm clicking into loans to be able to access this data view. I've created, a view's been created here um, on loans that are showing a delinquent status. So, um, let me just... And this is what defines, we'll get more into advanced filtering, but this is um, 
how we've limited the list of data in our loan loans data view to be able to represent loans that are only in uh, a delinquent current payment status. And this is the view manager. So um, let's see, yes, we've got servicer currently grouped, um, sorted ascending. So to remove this grouping mechanism, you just um, click on it, hold, click over servicer and drag it outside of that window. Now servicer is brought back down into the columns, the column header row within the data view. Let's um, play around here. I'll change the sort on loan numbers to descending by clicking on loan number, click it a third time to clear the filter on it. And then let's look at our list of delinquent loans grouped by lender. So now we can see that um, both servicer and lender are brought into the grouping area and we're looking at all uh, three loans that uh, which Century Housing is our lender that are in currently in a delinquent status. Um, let's go back. Oh, bear with me here. I guess I'll try not to jump out too many more times. So I showed you sorting there, grouping, um, subtotals in groups. So the, these are, you can subtotal an entire column in the data view into a, um, footer of the data view down at the bottom. And you can do that in data view admin. So if you would like to see a roll up of the um, columns that have a data type of integer, then you can check the sum in the sum checkbox in the data view admin screen to be able to turn that on or off. So I'll get into data view admin in just a minute. We'll jump back to the UI. So I also was showing you grouping by multiple columns. Uh, more than one can be applied there. So as I was showing servicer and lender here, I'm showing loan status and servicer. So Within loan status, which is the parent filter um, or grouping mechanism here being applied, you've got a list of servicers that are that roll up into the loan status of funded. Uh, dispersing would be below this with the servicers grouped under that as well to change the order of, of these grouping mechanisms. If you want to look at um, grouping by servicer first and then loan status second to be able to have all of the loans with it by a single servicer with their corresponding statuses, uh, then you would just drag servicer over before loan status within this blue window to be able to reorganize the grouping on this data view. And 
it doesn't work to the right. So don't try to take loan status and put it after servicer. You have to put servicer before loan status or loan status before servicer. Um, sorting groups. You can set the sort order on groups by setting the sort order of the of the columns that are grouped. So the arrow next to the group name indicates the sort order of the group. You can see loan status um, is ascended is ascending sorted because that it was brought over into the grouping mechanism where a ascending sort was applied on the data view and servicer is descending. Removing groups, as I mentioned, just drag that up and out of the grouping um, window to be able to remove that and bring loan status back down as a column in the data view. Um, So if you are looking for a subset of records, uh, specifically in a, in a certain time period, you can use the between filtering option. So you've got in, in our filtering window, you've got no filter applied that will clear any filter equal to, uh, let's, use compliance start date you're uh, for equal to you're looking at a specific date not equal to the vice versa of um, the former there greater than above a certain date less than greater than or equal to so you'd be capturing 1114 and then any date above that less than or equal to the vice versa between which is used by using the two dates in a two-digit month, two-digit day, two-digit year space, and then the second date that you want to look for. So you'll type these dates in first into the filtering window and then click the filtering button and click between to be able to see all of your compliance start and end dates between 1-1-2014 and 1-1-2020, according to this. So advanced and grid filters. So though, yeah, those might be between, not between, greater than or equal to or less than or equal to. Um, with the logic that I've mentioned before. So yeah, another point worth mentioning is depending on the type of data that you're looking at, the filtering options will be adjusted. So you wouldn't have between when you're looking at lender name, for example, but you would have between when you're looking at two dates or two amounts There would be no application to using greater than first rate mortgage, for example, on a servicer. So that's kind of what that's talking about. Custom views. So this, which brings us to our next poll question. How we'll do the poll question and I'll keep moving. So Sam, if you can open up the poll, we'll give you 30 seconds and then we'll uh, review the answers together. What am I doing on time? Okay. In which subject area do you use data views most frequently? Dev, uh, development, construction, uh, monitoring, TC, do you want to see um, how many credits have been issued in the current cycle? How many credits are rolling over to a future allocation year? Do you want to look at asset management with all of your compliance information, reviews, et cetera, or your portfolio property? or which do you use most frequently?
Okay, Sam, if you could. Yes, go ahead and try to advance to the next slide. We'll see if they are populated. Let's see if it does. Giving it, I'm giving it a few extra seconds for the delay. Okay. No dice. Um, so for dev, that was nine responses. Uh, TC, we had six. Asset management, five. And portfolio property, 13. Could you repeat those again? Yes, so for dev, there were nine responses. For TC, there were six. For asset management, there were five. And then portfolio property, there were 13. Okay. So it sounds like most of you are getting at the parent object of portfolio properties. So custom view manager. Let me go in and make some edits in the custom view manager within a uh, data view in portfolio properties here. But first, uh, view manager allows you to save custom views with predefined columns, uh, filters, sorts, grouping mechanisms. Um, save views can be reused quickly to get back to a regularly used data view where you've predefined a set of columns. Um, and then user created views are private to each user. So public views can be created to ensure everyone's looking at the same results, but there's a different navigation to do that. You have to create a public view in data view admin. So um, I'm gonna jump back over to the user interface. We'll take a couple of minutes and um, play with uh, a data view here in the portfolio property subject area. Let's just do properties. So then We've clicked into um, properties within portfolio property. So list our whole list of our whole portfolio. Now we'll go into the view manager. We'll click new um, to create a new view. We'll use uh, we'll just we we can name it so. We'll do that. Um, add, add all, remove, remove all. Be very careful when you're removing a single column or adding a, a column. If you're too close to the line and you click add all, and then you'll be, um, this will be a result. And you'll have every single column in the table in the data view. That can be frustrating. Um, to avoid this, make sure you're saving frequently while you're building your data view. If you're putting in if you're starting from scratch and you're adding um, 30 or 40 columns, maybe save every 10 so that you can prevent uh, having to redo your work. Um, let's see. So, if you're on Chrome, you can use Control F to kind of tab through the columns that you want to put into your data view. That's that's something I use to get around pretty quickly here. Um, so we want to get property name, property use, some of the physical information like the state. We'll get the um, county as well and the city. And then we'll look at some of the assigned users on this portfolio property. So shift click 
works here as well. You can add multiple columns at a time using that. See if these are active or not. Okay, so now we don't want active at the beginning of, at the end of our data view. So we'll use this up button to move it um, ahead in the columns in the data view. So now it'll be shown at the beginning of, in the second column, whereas previously it would have been at the end. So now we've got Ben's portfolio. We'll, we're, we'll save and close it. You do have to select the view after you've created it. So um, it won't bring you to exactly to where you uh, were just developed the view. You created the view. Now you're selecting the view. Um, so now this is the view that I've just created. We'll turn our filter grid on. And we'll filter oh, these. That's going to be Colorado. We're going to filter to... Inactive. So these are some examples of different data types. You can have equal to, not equal to, um, or filter types, sorry, and is null or not is null on active. But when you're looking at, uh, I guess I don't have any date fields in here, but for assigned CCO, you have more options to choose from. So we'll click the checkbox to say active is true. And then we'll do equal to that condition. So now we're going to look at active properties filtered by or grouped by property use. So property use is null on this set of records. And then let's say we don't want to see that. So We can use not is null to be able to remove those those records. And then we're filtered by property or grouped by property use. And now we'll want to see property by property use by county. When you change the filter, the sort on a uh, column header here, that'll be reflected in the grouping mechanism as well. So now we're we're grouped by property use by county, sorted by county, county descending. So we can see all of our general residential properties in York County. So, okay, let's get back to the presentation. I've got more slides to get through and not a lot of time to do it. You name is required. That was Ben's portfolio. I've kind of already gone through all of this. So available columns are on the left, selected columns are on the right. If you like somebody's data view that the data view that someone's using in your agency, but want to make some changes to it, you can copy it using the copy button there and then create um Sam's portfolio from Ben's portfolio, but maybe you don't want to have county included so you can remove that column, rename the, create a copy, name it Sam's portfolio, and then a custom tailor to your own needs. So I've kind of gone through all of that in the user interface. Advanced filters, talked about this a little bit at the, at the beginning of the presentation. Um, but those allow you to create more complex filters to queries to filter the records into your custom data view. This gives you a higher level of granularity into the, the records that are showing in your data view when it's generated. So um, rather than bringing in a list of all portfolio properties just filtered or grouped by a certain set of conditions, we can define the records that are actually showing on the data view to, to begin with 
based on some criteria. So to do that from the view manager, you click on the tab called advanced filter. Um, in this example, total units is less than or equal to 50. So we want to only see um, even unfiltered or unsorted properties that have 50 or less, 50 or fewer units. And then we want to make sure that all, we're only looking at active properties to begin with. So we're filtering to active is equal to true. The generated query is displayed. Um, this is a where statement for those of you who are more familiar with SQL. So that's what we're doing here is creating a where statement directly in the user interface. So you can see total units is now less than or equal to 50 and active is set to true. Using UDFs in reporting. So UDFs, for those of you aren't, that aren't familiar, are user-defined fields. Somebody may have talked about this already in a separate session, so I won't spend too much time on it. But these are user-defined fields are flexible fields that you can enter onto um, specific objects and then have them live on a page or be used in a data view. Um, so those that is meant to capture information that's not stored in a default um, or a pre-existing field in um, in Prolink. So an example of that would be, uh, let's say you, and this isn't a, uh, necessarily a practical application, but let's say you want to capture the cert on a loan. You want to see the servicers. Um, servicer contact middle name um, because that's an important thing for you to view So or uh, submit in a report. Um, so you can create a UDF on the loan object to show um, servicer contact middle name. Um, you can set the page, the UDF tab that that lives on uh, you, could, you could rename it from custom fields to um, loan servicer contact information and then have that field live on a page or you could not have it live on a page and just be available in a data view or maybe um, to, to allow for interfacing um, using smart docs and then have that be created into a data view but not live on a page if um, it's truly not something that you want to see displayed on a screen. So these are the reasons for using a UDF, as I've mentioned. It's additional information where it's not a, you don't have a field for it already existing on an object. And these are our section, this is our UDF tab, custom fields, and these are our section headers, Denver attributes, entity cash flow, split details, et cetera. Um, creating a, U a UDF is done in utilities. It's way at the bottom of utilities and user, there's a cog and then um, as an icon and then user defined fields. And then you find the object that you wanna place the UDF on, TC deals, for example, um, so you click there and you will, you'll see you're not allowed to click new from this screen because first you have to select an object type. So we've clicked on um, object type of portfolio properties and then you can, from there you click new, this menu is, um, this is brought up you uh, from add user defined field here, sorry. Um, within add user defined field. You're brought to edit user defined field, display the the field title, the data type. Um, I'll get more into data types shortly. The object type is active. And then if you wanna see it display on a data view, check this box. On reporting view is not required to have a user defined field displayed on a data view that's used only um, for 
directly for displaying on our report in the report section. So the you've got alphanumeric, these are the options for field data type alphanumeric, which is numbers and letters, a currency, which is a dollar amount, um, data type formats it as this uh, dollar sign number dot zero zero. If you want to convert that, you've got to do it. Um, you've got to do some manipulation in a uh, custom data view if you want to show show that uh, in a different way. And then the date formats are two digit month, day, and um, four digit year. Numeric is just numbers, percentages, uh, binary fields here, just as a yes, no, uh, pick lists. So pick lists are just a list of values. They can be user-defined lists of values. Um, in the sake of time, I won't really get into pick lists today. Text area, which is like, think of a comment box. And then is active or inactive. So you can't delete custom fields once you create them. So be very careful. Make sure to review the object that you're placing it, the, the user-defined field that you want to create. Review the list of user-defined fields before you create it so that you don't create duplication because then you won't be able to delete it. It'll still live in the user interface, but you can inactivate it. I would also recommend renaming it to something like I don't know, five X's or something, if that's the case, so as to not cause confusion. Um, so a category name breaks things that breaks the UDFs down into a smaller chunk. So those are the sub tabs that I was mentioning before, the section headers uh, within a category group the data into sections on a page, and then the sort order is um, for edit on screen is available as well. So if not specified, you'll just have an alphanumeric A to Z sort, but you can customize that if there is a different way that you'd like to see the UDFs appear. You can set the order of them as well. So then you'll navigate to the UDF in the object that you placed it in the system and you can enter the value there. So this is a pick list uh, user defined field. So you've got a drop down available to select Denver Historical Society, National Historic Landmark or National Register from the historical designation user defined field. Um, okay. Hey Ben, time check for five minutes. Yep, all right. So what's, yeah, UDFs can be custom, it can be added to your uh, data views as well. So let's get into use, use, uh, custom data views. Unfortunately, I've kind of run out of time, but custom data views are for times when you need to have a data view created, a, a visualization with information across multiple objects. Uh, that isn't that isn't available in a visualization created in a data views, which are by subject area. So where you're trying to include multiple subject areas, you've got to join the tables together. You can do that using a custom data view. So you can perform calculations, get summaries or aggregations. Um, once published, oh, do you need time right now, Bree? Uh, no, no, you're good. I was just going to okay. chime in here. Like our custom data views feature is on the more technical side because there's some SQL knowledge that's required to be able to build those custom data views. Yeah. Um, so certainly I think we should go over the highlights and um, we have done some custom data view webinars and trainings both of which I think we have recordings for. So if you are interested in this, um, generally speaking, you would need to, to write them yourself, to build them yourself, you would need to have that SQL kind of background 
or include those in your organization who have that or work with ProLink to help assist with that. Yes, thank you, Bree. Um, okay, so. And then ask, um, so ETL versus transactional, this is the data. You can create a custom data view from the ETL data warehouse, which is the default option. So this is based on a copy of the database. You're not running your query that you're generating for as on the custom data view against the, um, the live database. That's the transactional database. You're doing it on a copy. So this prevents a degradation of the database and also potentially decreases in system performance of the live system if you are running a large query against the transactional database. So you can choose those by default with the ETL data warehouse. If you want to run a custom data view against a transactional database, it requires approval from our IT departments. So reach out to them if you want to do that. Yep. Um, I would skip the the custom data views. If you have any last points, I would make those, Ben. The la and the reason, just while he's navigating to that, um, if you have one last slide, Ben, um, the reason why we don't usually, you have to receive approval for um, connecting to the live database is if we have a bunch of custom data views connected for that real-time data, um, it can really slow the system down. So we have to be careful about that. However, most people's backups are scheduled nightly. So you're talking about within 24 hours for that data, um, you know, that you can build on your own without any kind of involvement or approval from us. Yep, thanks, Bree. Um, So I'll finish on this slide. This is going into the proling table structure for those of you familiar with the, um, ProLink a table structure, and I do believe we have database diagrams that are available in SQL Server, SQL, um, SQL Management Server. So this is showing de how Dev Deals can connect to portfolio properties. You can have you can create a custom data view showing the Dev Deal information with information on the portfolio property where those aren't available to be created in a single data view within the user interface. You do that by linking through the dev deal portfolio properties table on IDs to be able to generate the portfolio property information along with the dev deal information. And then you can also join in the entities that are set on to the uh, dev deal by looking at the dev deal entity table and then, and then going through that as a linker table to the entity record to be able to pull that onto your dev deals data view as well. So you're getting three subject areas for the price of one um, by creating those um, custom data views, but it is more involved as Bree mentioned and it requires some SQL knowledge. So I guess I'll pick this up on another, on another day, but um, thank you everybody so much for your time. I hope you learned something. And um, if not, I hope the coffee and bagels were good this morning. So thanks <laughs> again. And um, uh, thanks, have a great holiday, everyone. All right. uh, thank you. You know what? That's probably um, running short on time. Getting into custom data views is probably a bit of a silver lining because we'd all be brain dead if we now covered that. Um, it's pretty complex, but once you do get to set it up, um, it can really be a beneficial add. So we'd certainly love to discuss that with you if you're interested. Um, and we did cover the custom data views training last year in our 2023 Tech Live. So I think Sam from our marketing team just posted that link for you in the chat. And so you have a recording of, if you have the brain cells still there, then go ahead and spend your afternoon looking at that recording or um, spend it you know, later this week if you're interested in, in a more detailed um, training just on custom data views. Okay, do we have any Q&A that we need to follow up on, Sam? I bring no Q&A currently. Okay, am I sharing my screen? I think I am with everybody. I see the Q&A slide. Okay, great. So I'll just wrap up for um, this event. Ben, thank you very much for covering data views for us and reporting. It's um, a very important area of the net benefit you know, out of ProLink HFA. And we have a lot of 
uh, attention that we spend on that part of ProLink HFA. So I hope um, those who attended got some value out of the session. Please provide us with feedbacks, follow-up questions. Um, you know, if you need any help from us, we'd be glad to help you. So for the next little under 15 minutes, we're going to go into our coffee and bagel break space until 2.45 p.m. Eastern. Um, so please note that um, this is the last coffee and bagel of the conference. So we'll see you there for our final um, kind of opportunity to mingle. Um, and then we will be going into our dynamic UDF training uh, in ProLink HFA with Nick Jacques um, with ProLink, which begins at 2.45 Eastern. So um, we'll see you there for that. And we will be issuing a $50 Starbucks gift card for the for one individual who goes to Coffee and Bagel right now. So um, go ahead and participate if you would like the opportunity to be part of that giveaway. And we will see you after the break.